All right, welcome in another edition of the Ryan and Goodman podcast. He's Bob Ryan. I'm Jeff Goodman. And uh, we got a nice day here in, uh, in Massachusetts. We got NBA games. Uh, hockey's gone off well. No positive COVID tests in the NBA, Bob. So you know what? Life so is far, pretty good. So far, so good with, with them. Yes. <clears throat> you know, we don't want to get cocky. Nobody can get cocky. We don't want any slip ups. But so far, their approach, if, if people have been doing their, their due diligence, has been, it's been very rewarding so far for them. And that's really good news, of course. Um, we have to, by the way, before I go, anything else? Yeah. Did you have Michael Porter Jr. in your Player of the Week poll? Pool. I, I did not, but I'll, but I'll tell you what, there has been no bigger fan. Uh, I've championed the Michael Porter Jr. fan club for years, Bob. Years. On the court. Not off, I hope. I'm the, <laughs> not, not, not his <laughs> off-the-court uh, thoughts and opinions. <laughs> okay. On the court, I'm telling you, Bob, I had him as a number one pick when I first saw him as a sophomore in high school. I said, this kid oh. in today's NBA – He's the closest thing that I had seen at that time to Kevin Durant at the same age and the same stage. Now, there's a kid, you and I have talked about him a little bit, named Amani Bates, who is a high school junior, who is even closer in terms of his look and his game to KD. But Michael Porter Jr., when he was healthy, Bob, he played on an AU team called the Mocan Elite. And his teammate was a little guard named Trey Young, who was a top 50 player and, and a good little player, but it was a Michael Porter show. It was absolutely the Michael Porter show with that team because here's this kid who looked the part, strong, long, could rise up and shoot threes. It was picturesque. It was pretty. He could get the ball off the glass, and his dribble wasn't great. His handle was, it needed to tighten up a little bit, but he could take it off the glass a little bit like KD can and go the length of the court and finish over dudes or rise up on them. I really thought he'd be the number one overall pick, and then injuries just mm -hmm. absolutely. So I wound up being the 14th pick. Yes. And then last year, 18-19, was injured due to a back, did not play, and was making no impact, none, none. prior to the pandemic. I looked it up. It is, uh, it's just an amazing story. Yeah. In his last three games before the shutdown, he played in a total of 33 minutes with seven points and four rebounds. And in his final game, which is on March 11th, he was scoreless in five minutes of play, which now we will fast forward to last Sunday yes. against the uh, OKC boys. Suddenly, he erupts for 37 and 12. Follows that up last night with 30 and 15, five for nine three-pointers. What was going on in the first portion of the season? Do you know? Th that I don't know. You know, I, I didn't follow it quick, yeah. closely enough because he wasn't making an impact, and a lot of people had kind of forgotten about him. But, you know, I, I think part of it is the opportunity, and he had guys in front of him, Bob, right? He had Will Barton, uh, who's out right now. He had Gary Harris and Jamal Murray. All these guys had to play. And they were ahead of him. But you do wonder, if you're Mike Malone, why didn't you find some minutes for this kid if he was healthy? Now, maybe uh, maybe. maybe over the last four months, again, I he needed been. that time still to get 100%. We don't know because he's had some, some hip issues, some back, you know. He's had numerous issues. And it's funny, a lot of people attribute it, the fact that they don't eat meat in their, in their family. They don't eat meat at all. And his whole family, everybody in the family has had injuries, Bob. He, he's got a younger brother who, who was out for the year um, at Missouri also. His, his older sisters, two of them have had major injuries. So it, it, it is really run in the family. And you wonder if it's just something genetic or whatnot. But when this kid is on the court, I've said this, if he could ever be healthy, I'm telling you, this is a kid who could absolutely be a game changer. And in today's NBA, he is the ideal player because he's got a lot of – he's a better shooter than Jason Tatum, to be honest. He's a better shooter. He's, he's longer than Tatum. Uh, I don't think he's – obviously, he hasn't progressed like Jason has. 
yeah. uh, that's a big difference. But Jason's been on the court healthy, and we, we just haven't seen that out of Michael Porter for the last three years. No, and by the way, it was an interesting game last night. They played Denver, and after the game uh, – and then Denver beat them. And after the game, Greg Popovich, God love – I love – you know, yeah. there's nothing like a Greg Popovich dissertation. That's right, know? nothing. Right? In the same dissertation, he manages – and discussing Nikola Jokic to invoke both Larry Bird and Moses Malone. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I guess, I guess there is a little bit, well, yeah. you know, the passing yeah. and he, the, the Malone thing was the put back ability and the, the ability that he was tip, tip, tip to himself. He said, you know, kind of thing. And without a lot of lift and Moses right, wasn't the normal. body. Moses yeah. wasn't, you know, his rebounding didn't depend on, on great explosion right. or lifting. It was on anticipation diligence you know and instinct hands even though they were very small hands by the way you know that very notorious no. small hands. moses you could barely palm you really? would, you would a lot of pictures of moses slamming dunk and maybe with two hands yeah notoriously small hands and but no one wanted the rebound more you know number one rule of rebounding ryan's fight rule number one do you want the damn ball or don't yeah. you Go two, after it. two positioning three timing and then last and Oh, it helps if you can jump, but it ain't necessary. Necessary anyway. He come. He com He invoked both Larry and Moses, talking about Jokic, and That's I just crazy. love pop. Nowhere else would do that. <laughs> nobody, nobody, because again, it's so out of the the, yeah. the norm of what you would think, right? You're you're not, you're not gonna. No, he's got a little bit of both, and, and I actually like that because when we when we tend to compare somebody, we tend to want to compare one person, and mm -hmm. it's rarely. It can't be accurate, right? I mean, no, no one guy is like another guy. He's usually got a blend of two or three. We don't generally hear that like yeah. I just did it with Michael Porter, right? Kevin Durant. Well, he's love, not like I'm, Kevin Durant. Speaking of combos, here's yeah. the one I came up with when I first saw him in, at, in the University yeah. of Texas. Okay. AD. And actually, mostly when he got the NBA, I'd be more, I, I loved him in Texas, but I really – a cross between Bob McAdoo and George Gervin. Yeah, that George Gervin. He's obviously got more length, but yeah, Gervin's but, you know, so long and lanky. And, and, and not a fixed release point necessarily. He yep. can get off of any shot he wants and any, you know, he's not he's not a, yeah. a textbook beautiful right. you know, he's not Clay Thompson. He's not No, a, a no curve, it's different. But he can make it but 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 he can get in the mid you know, I just he can get in the mid range and do and do funky stuff. But yep. he doesn't do it that often, but he could. That's a, that was my – so I'm with you on the need to often to, to – and trying to analyze people to, to understand that, that they're all unique. They're all yeah. so generous. They so, are, and, and that's why, again, you compare them to one person, and it's almost not fair. It's not accurate, obviously, but it's not fair. It's almost better to say he's got a little bit of this guy right. in his game and a little bit of this guy and that, that – So in this part. case, Pop is saying that, that uh, Jokic can pass, remind him of Larry – and, not, and, and it, you know, he's got this rebounding uh, instinct and this, this knack that reminded him of Moses. And I, and, and I just find it's fascinating. And I believe, by the way, that Jokic is the best passing big man since Bill Walton. I don't think we've had a better passing big man in the, yeah. uh, since Bill Walton. I, I agree. I mean, Kevin Love had the outlet passes that were elite, but – but yeah, but he does he's that. Like he's, the best, he's the best outlet passer of this generation. No, not it's such a lost art anyway. There's hardly any competition. But right. he is the he does he does uh, is by far he's the leader in the clubhouse there. And I thought that Cleveland would take more advantage of it when they had LeBron. They did not. And then uh, you know, anyway, that's another story for another day. But anyway, back to comparisons and other uh, Michael yeah. Porter Jr. What a story! And now I got to admit, I can't wait now to see the next game to see. You know, no. what's coming. He's must see. What's he coming? now becomes must see TV. No question. Pop. Out of curiosity, since I didn't see either of these games, 100%. and you have a firm visual image because you go back so far, I had do not have that. Therefore, that's something else. You know, for my checklist, that's good. You know. Um, Can I also defend Michael Porter as a kid because he's going to get a lot of shit, and he has gotten a lot of stuff over the last week since he came out and basically, um, I, I don't want to say dispelled COVID to some degree, but, but kind of well, did. That's, that's a very polite way of saying yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> what I'll say is I, I've gotten a chance to know Michael and, and his brother, Jonte pretty well over the years. Um, and, and I really like them. I, I think they're really sweet kids, nice kids. Uh, again, I think, um, you know, a lot of times you're going to get, um, 
some of the information and, and your thoughts from your your parents. And I think maybe maybe he got the here. Each is you're entitled to your opinion, whether we agree with him or not. That doesn't make him a bad person. And I think that's what I want to get across here is Michael Porter and his and his brother Jante, uh, and we're talking Michael here is genuinely a good person. Now, this is the first, uh, this is the classic first amendment. You know, I mean, I think he's crazy, but he has a right to be crazy. I mean, right yeah. now that's, yeah, that's yeah. fine. Right. I don't agree. I think this take on this subject yes. is, is, is crazy. And yet he reflects the views of a frightening amount of people with regard to the vaccine thing. Great point. So that when we get to the vaccine, yep. you know, good luck trying to get some people to take it. And, and that scares me, you know, it should scare a lot of people, but anyway, yeah. All right. So you, we don't want to, we need to compartmentalize here. Right. It doesn't make him a bad human being. We, we can disagree. We can disagree. Well, I'm, I'm, well, I want to see this young lad play now. <laughs> well, the funny part is right at the start of all this in these kind of exhibition games, it was all about Bo Bo, right? Bo Bo, yeah. we can't wait to watch Bo Bo on Denver. And yeah. I'm sitting there shaking my head because I've seen Bo Bo a hundred times too. And yeah. I'm saying, yeah, yeah, he, he's, he's intriguing. And I fell for it early with Bo Bo too. I fell for it when I saw him in AU ball. Mm -hmm. I was like, holy crap, this kid, he, he, he's, he's so much more skilled than his father, than Manute, but he does some of those same things defensively and everything like that. But the more I watched him, the more I've talked to people around him, the more, number one, a lot of people question whether he loves the game. That's number one, which mm -hmm. is hard, right? If you don't love the game, yeah. eh, I don't, I'm not buying you. You're going to be a star or a great player. Oh, no, absolutely. Got to love it. I don't know if he loves it, number one. Number two, I always question how you're going to utilize a guy like this. Like, okay, I get it on the offensive end. He can shoot threes. That's great. On the defensive end, he can alter shots. But it's also one of those where he can't hold his ground at all. He's got no – there's no uh, core strength to Bo Bo. So I just don't know how effective he's going to be, how long his body's going to hold up. I mean, same thing with Michael Porter a little bit with the injury questions, but I think Bo Bo's got the injury questions and the love of the game question. Well, the, the ultra high guys, the ultra tall, what I'll put is over 7'3". The history, and I, I can go back to a guy named Sweet Hallbrook in the 50s from the, the Nats was the, it would actually shot jump shots and a little bit and not very well. But uh, the ultra, how many of them have been, you know, the, 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 the success rate is not real, real high. You know, we have, we have they, sometimes there's a flash of, of effectiveness, but it, 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 they always get hurt. It, it isn't sustainable. Georgie Mirasan was a force for a while. He was, yeah, he was. You're he right. Last. Sean Bradley, by the way, speaking of not loving the game, I don't think. And I, I, I really think he fits in that category. You know, he, he had to play basketball. He was 7'4 and 16 years old. I did a story on him out there when he was 16 years old. Um, I went out there, spent four days in Castledale, Utah, with one of my favorite episodes of, of my ever in my whole career was, was that phenomenon of being out there when he was watching him and, and living in the culture, you know, and the whole thing. Story we'll talk about someday. It was a great story. It was a lot, a lot of fun. But he, 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 he didn't, he had a, he led the league in block shots once or twice. Different kid. Just but, a different type of kid. Yeah, uh, yeah, very different. Um, I'm taking, oh, there's another, um, there's some, well, I would just, so, guys, I, I'm trying to think of some names I don't even think of. You know why? Because there weren't that many good. Like, and then, of course, the best one, of course, was, was Yao. And then ultimately, Yao was cut short by injury. His feet, the body, the, 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 rest of the, the, the lower limbs don't like all that running around and jumping, from what I gather. Oh, especially the, when the limbs are that thin. Yeah. When you've got bow bow, right? You have you, not only your legs, but, but it's your core strength as well. And I, I just, again, I'm I'm gonna buy a stock in Michael Porter, and I have bought it forever. I, my only concern was would he would he get healthy and stay healthy? And I'm not buying it on Bobo. I'm just not, and, and I'm a skeptic. Um, you know who I am buying lately? Who? T.J. Warren. Oh, God, you got to talk about that. Oh that, my God, my 34, 32, and the Pacers. Who I don't know about you, but I know you did. You wrote him off because your boy Sabonis was done yeah. with plantar fasciitis, yes. and and Victor Oladipo probably isn't going to be Victor Oladipo. It's still going to take him some time. But my, oh, my. So, T.J. Warren, I'll give you a good story. He went to Brewster Academy up yes. in New Hampshire. Yes. Factory. Yes. Well, well, New Hampshire. Yes. Still amazes me because I go back. I, I know that town. I know that yeah. area. My, my, great, great my town. In -laws, my in-laws 
had a place up there for 50 years. And I, I still can't believe Brewster Academy is this basketball behemoth. But anyway, there you go. I remember uh, tweeting about T.J. Warren when he was at Brewster Academy and, uh, and saying something to the effect of that, that he wasn't buying in, that, that he, was, he was lazy. Uh, the coach there, Jason Smith, had his issues with him early. And he was already committed to NC State. And NC State fans don't like me anyway. <laughs> um, they just they just don't because you know it's one of those th things where they haven't been that good they think they're you know they, they still feel themselves in the Jimmy V days and they were horrible with Sidney Lowe they ran out Herb Sendek to, to to get Sidney Lowe then Mark Godfrey is it was a cheater and and he didn't do I didn't like that hire anyway to make a long story short so I tweeted something about uh T.J. Warren and uh, at that time, he wasn't buying into Brewster Academy. And, uh, and I think he might have even gone back at me with a tweet. But I know NC State <laughs> did. And, and then I didn't give him ACC Player of the Year when he was at NC State because they weren't an NCAA they, – they were like a fringe NCAA tournament team. Yeah. So I just couldn't give it to somebody. That's how I am generally. Like, unless you're a lock NCAA tournament team – I'm not going to give you player of the year in whatever league you are in because I value winning above anything else. If you're that good, if you're a player of the year in your league, your team should be a lock NCAA tournament team. So they, yeah. they went after me for that too. Uh -huh. um, but man, TJ Warren, I never saw this. I mean, you knew he was a scorer at his core, but I never saw 53, 34, 32. You know, I looked it up. You know, because I'm, I'm not been painting. I know he's there. Come on. You know, I mean, I like, I know 50, 75, 100, 200 NBA players, you know, are, you know, I know they're there. I know who they are. I've been there to basic sure. background, but I'm not, I'm not all. He averaged 19 points a game a couple years ago. I didn't even know it. <laughs> he was averaging 19 before all this started, by the way. And uh, he can score it. He so can really score it. It's better than I certainly realized in that, as an NBA. And I was well aware of his, of his background and all that, you know. But right, but he's a story. So Porter's a story. Uh, yeah, two two new stories that we didn't have four months ago. That's for sure. And, and you know what? Another story is, and we've talked about it last week, but even more now, the Sixers. You know, now we got Ben Simmons, who's got a you know not a major injury, but an injury. Uh, and Bede's been sensational. Oh, the numbers, putting up giant numbers. Sensational, 33 and 14 uh, since he's been in the bubble. So you can't really go after him. Um, you know, I, I, I still think the biggest problem for them is, is the fit. Just the fit with that team together. And I remember before the season, forget who it was. You might actually have been there that day. You weren't there when we were talking about it. But it was right early in the season uh, – in the, in the media room, the new Celtics media room, talking to a couple of reporters. And, and they were saying how good they, the Sixers were going to be defensively because they had great individual defenders, right? They had added Al Horford to a team with uh, Ben Simmons and, and, and Joel. And obviously they've got uh, Tybal there too. Um, but I just said, like, I just don't know how they fit together was my biggest thing um, as far as having these three – guys in Hortford and Bede and Tobias that none of which can really guard a three man and you got Ben Simmons who doesn't want to shoot it on the offensive end so what was the spacing going to be like there because Hortford now likes to throw it you know a, a face up five and yeah. Bede's a face up five Tobias likes to shoot it too it just it just didn't fit to me together and and now I think you're looking at Brett Brown and you know, that, that he really, really could be in trouble for his job. Well, I mean, he's been a, a subject of, of speculation for, for years. You know, he had to go through the process. And, and I was very happy that he was allowed to, to reap whatever benefits they've been able to, you know, reap so far. They're, they're, that they're a better than average team, if not a pretty good team. Uh, and, and he gets to be – but people will expect more there there's no doubt they, they they want a fulfillment of greater fulfillment than getting knocked out in the first round for example right now they're in a three six game and um right and yeah they're right today they're it's celtic sixers yeah. today it's celtic sixers which yeah. and, and I if you're the celtics stuff. who would you rather face would you rather face a, a pacers team with tj warren and i don't know if sabonis is going to come back or not I'll, I'll i'll listen i got plantar fasciitis 
I've had it since December, Bob, and have been unable to get rid of it. Now, again, it could last two weeks. It could last, I was told, up to a year. I'm going on seven months. Um, now, I'm not Sabonis. No. I'm not, we, we know I'm not as tough as Sabonis, anybody named Sabonis. Uh, but, you know, they may not have him. If you're the Celtics, do you want Philly? You might, you might rather Philly than Indiana. Yeah, um, the, the team I, I don't want to mess around with is Miami, myself. But if I'm they're the, playing well. They're playing well. If I'm the Celtics, so there's something there. I don't know. The but, top six uh, in the East. I'm not afraid. But it's, I'm not afraid of either one. I mean, if the Celtics play their game, they beat either one. But the thing is, they're they're not reliable to me yet. You know, they're certainly not reliable, and they've been very weird in this postseason or in this new season already. And um, uh, Gary Washburn wrote a very interesting piece um, day, yesterday about. You know, who are they to walk on the court and think the game's won? You know, they got, you know, they, they handed the game away the other day and they, they um, and they shouldn't have. And, and you know, they, they, they're a little bit too cocky for their own good. They're talented. Yeah, we all know they're talented. Up front. They got four, they got, for like, the, so I'd say one through seven, one through six, they're really, really good on paper, you know, but, but they got to go play. They got to do it and they got to defend better than they've been doing. Anyway, I, I don't, I'm not real full of super confidence of them no matter who they play, the way they're playing, if they go back and play, they'll start winning where they can. That's different. But uh, that's a good supposition. I, we don't know how hurt Simmons is, right? And that's a knee. It's all we know. It's a knee. I don't know. Did you see anything today? I don't think it's bad. Yeah, I, I've, I've heard it's nothing. There's nothing structural. Um, and again, listen, if you're Philly, if you're playing your game, you can beat anybody. But I, I feel like you, all these teams, you can beat anybody. You can lose to anybody in the top six in the East. Now I'll put my money on Milwaukee because yeah, you've got, you got to draw. I don't, I'm not drawing a line. You got to put Toronto on the line. To me, to me, there I'm too. I'm yeah. with Toronto. I'm on Toronto bandwagon. I'm really convinced. Culture. It's culture is what it is in Milwaukee and Toronto. We don't know. Do the Celtics have that culture yet? I, I you can't say it. You can't, they haven't done it yet. Like Milwaukee, like Toronto have done it. I love again. I don't think I trade one through four in Boston for any other one through four. Um, my big thing is again, we, we talked about their bench is just uh, you just don't know what you're gonna get. You, you're missing one guy. You're missing one guy to come off the bench and get you 15 in a, in a given game. Absolutely. And you just don't have that. Don't have that guy, and they haven't had that guy uh, since. Well, they haven't had that guy probably since Eddie House, but they haven't had that guy. Uh, and uh, it's been, I've been moaning about this for three years. Even yeah. when they had the great run two years ago, they managed to, it was in the playoffs, they managed to circumvent the fact that, that that was, they did not have that guy. We can't, we're talking about names and performances and, and, and you, you know, I got to see him play kind of thing. How about those two guys in Dallas right now, what they're doing, those two youngsters oh uh, from God. Latvia and Slovenia? How about that? Huh? I'll tell you what, Mark Cuban. Uh... Oh. I don't want to say lucked out, but but he did luck out a little bit here, getting Porzingis like he did. I mean, yeah, it, it got, loses... for minimal cost, you know, basically they they handed it over to the Knicks did to him, and uh, and Porzingis is putting up huge numbers now. Doncic is putting up sick triple doubles. Um, boy, you know they're and together they're about as old as Jamal Crawford. <laughs> it's amazing. No. Yeah. It, it, the, the, the future of that franchise now, if they can add, like, one more piece, right? You, yes. And, again, who wouldn't want to play with Luca? Oh, yeah, he's going to get you the ball. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he and sees now, so, you know, under Cuban, it's a player-friendly player -friendly atmosphere. I mean, there is no more player-friendly owner, you know, for amenities and, you know, and making your life comfortable and making you feel like a king. I, I don't think than than uh, the Cuban in Dallas. Yeah. No, he's that, the anti Dolan. That's what he is. He's the yeah. anti Dolan. So yeah. I mean, I know I I would be like, I wouldn't mind being that extra ingredient guy, you know. But so uh, they they bear watching. But but just I wanted to give them what we're, we're talking about individual performances. We we have to go with them. Uh, those two kids are putting up great numbers. All right. So Memphis. Oh. Uh, they look to be in great shape going into this, even though they had a tough schedule. You would say, like, all right, they're still going to be able to play in this eight nine game, no matter what. Well, it's it's no longer no matter what because they're losing games, and they oh by the way, they lost Jaron Jackson Jr. for the rest of the year, which is a killer blow. Uh, now there's a scenario 
that could come into play where Memphis doesn't even play in the playing game, I believe, that if they go 0 for 4, their next four, which are against Oklahoma City, Toronto, Boston, and Milwaukee, so they could legitimately go 0 for 4. Yeah. Then oh, yeah. Oklahoma could pass them, and San Antonio could pass them, New Orleans could pass them. I mean, right. well, it's could finish ahead of Memphis. Yes, well, right now the whole thing is crazy. For people who don't know, they have concocted this ridiculous scenario whereby in order to determine who's the eighth seed in the conference, if there's a four-game gap or more at the end between eight and nine, then it's done. But if there's less than four, uh, the eight, whoever nine is plays eight. And not even in a, in, a, in a crazy scenario in which if eight wins the first game, it's over. But if nine wins, they play again and they have to win two. Nine has to win two out of three. Eight has to win one out of one. <laughs> And it's ridiculous. In order, in order to get in. Uh, and suddenly the West is a um, – there's a couple of words we could use or we won't, just we'll be polite. There might be youngsters listening. But, you know, uh, there's ways to describe what this is that we all know. It's, it's, but what it is is right now that as we speak at the moment – and there's a game will be going on on, on a Thursday afternoon that will alter something. But as we speak right now in advance of that game, four teams are within one game and a loss between eight and, and six – Six within two when you throw in Phoenix and Sacramento. And Sacramento. Are you excited so, by this, Bob? Like, do you like this or do you hate this? I, 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 I'm a mute. I don't care. You know, I'm let them do it. I look, this is, they deserve the NBA to have a, 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 you know, a mess. They got, I'm my only question, how are they going to do tie? What if three teams are tied? That's what, what you want. You want a three way tie. What complete chaos. I want three <laughs> But at a spot. I want, I want to know how they, you know, adjudicate who, who they eliminate before they go to the 8-9 game. I know, head-to-head. Well, what if they well, – how, how many tiebreakers are we going to have to get down? Bob, they're going to do a, they're going to do a three-point shooting contest between uh, – <laughs> that's what they're going to do. Dave, Dave, Lillard, Dave, Lillard, Dave Lillard, Patty Mills. I'm glad. And Zion. Zion's going to go out there and have a three-point shooting contest. By the way, I have to say, the reason that you want – that they want Zion in was on display the other night when he was the – when he finished off a 70-foot alley-oop. <laughs> Now, that's, a hell of a, that's a great pass. I don't know which is better, the pass or the finish, but uh, you or I could theoretically make the pass if we got oh, one. Oh, easy, easy. It's Are the you finish kidding? that we're talking about in this case. That, Listen, like, the, the, the funniest part, I forget who said it. Somebody on the air after Zion's first game, they were like, he's so out of shape. He's got to get himself in shape. And I'm thinking to myself, like, do you watch him? Like, I get, yes, he could get in better shape than he is now. But – to say, like, he's out of shape and that's the – no. Like, he's, he's a mess defensively right now because he hasn't played a lot of basketball. That's the biggest – he's still young. Yeah. He's still – I mean, people forget that. He's played 25 NBA games. Like, give the kid a break. He's going to be a superstar, just a different type of superstar right now. He's not a guy that's going to, you know, jack threes. He, he, he's a matchup nightmare who plays hard. He's always smiling. There's no reason to criticize Zion Williamson. It's going to take some time before he becomes a really good defender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're right. It's a, but, you know, once again, we live in a world of unrealistic expectations. And right. uh, so, yeah, anyway, yeah, I'm rooting for chaos. I'm rooting for the whole thing. I want to see how they adjudicate it. And all for the honor of playing the Lakers. That's the funny thing is, speaking of which, yes. I'm 20 here, get my, my, my daily rant, you know how I feel about the three. I think it's the worst thing that happened to basketball in my lifetime. And when I look at the paper and I see a box score and I go, oh, the Lakers, who lost last night, yeah. five for 37 on threes. And that's not – that's ugly. That, yes. that, I'm not – I'm just saying that it's, that should not be. There shouldn't be a scenario where, where you would be encouraged to take 37 threes on the night when you're making five. And you know, you know, but Brad, uh, listen, the cell, Brad lets them do that too. If they all do it. It's like baseball and the relievers. You know, they all do it. Uh, uh, I keep going back to the famous Rockets playoff game when against the uh, the uh, Warriors when they missed their last twenty seven right. attempts. Right. When do you learn? When do you learn and say, "Hey, we're not. It's not the do theory," and all of a sudden we're going to start making them. How about it's it's not our night from there, and we're going to try something different. Or when or, or the Warriors when they lost to the Cavaliers. And, and they kept jacking up threes, and all they needed was one, two to stop the bleeding, and it just never occurred to anybody to try to do it. Anyway, that, that – meanwhile, you know, that, that was five for three, seven. That uh, uh, what, what I'll say is I, I, think, I think it would be better if we had a Portland Lakers 
first round matchup. I just think that's that's a matchup people can get into because again, you've got Damian Lillard, you've got CJ McCollum, Nurkic, like you got enough there that makes that an intriguing matchup, even if playing well. Playing really well. And Zach Collins is good. Played well against the Celtics. I like I loved him. Uh, yeah, I love. I liked him a lot in college. Yep. Zach Collins. Um, uh, yeah. Um, but Nurkic, he looked he really hurt the Celtics the other night. You know, he's a he's a he is a load, but he's a load with good feet, you know. He knows so how some, to play this game. Some he news knows. just broke. I broke some news on the college front, uh, right before the start of the podcast. How about this? You know, Howard University, do you remember this about a month ago? They landed Don Maker's cousin, McCurr yeah. Maker, right. top 15 player. Yep. And uh, he withdrew from the NBA draft. So he's probably going to go to Howard at the end of the day as long as there's a college season, right? Yeah. Um, so they just got – I broke – Purdue transfer named Nogel Eastern just transferred to Howard as well. Oh. That's... So Howard could have a high major transfer, and, 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 and he's an elite passer and defender. He's not a shooter at all, e- Eastern. But he's played three years at Purdue. Three years? Yeah, three years. Again, he averaged like five points a game. Um, good kid, just uh, can't shoot it. Uh, and, and they could have uh, Maker, too, on their team. Kenny Blakeney, former uh, former Duke player, now coaches at Howard. And it, it's interesting because the kid Maker, if he had gone straight to the NBA, Bob, nobody knew who he was. Nobody cared who he was. Now you know who he is. Oh, yeah. Everybody knows who he is because he went to Howard. This kid's um, – his profile, uh, his brand has absolutely blown up. I don't trust his guy. His guardian is a guy named Ed Smith who lied to me years ago and said Thon Maker was going to go to college when he didn't. Um, and he ended up being a lottery pick. So I, I can't fault him for it. But he, but he lied to my face and said he's 100% going to college. So I don't trust the guy. Um, but I think if, if – McCurr Maker goes to Howard, and now Nogel Eastern goes and gets a waiver and is able to play this season. Yeah, that's interesting. It could be fun to watch. And HBCU like Howard, um, I think they're on the map now. So I, I hope there's a season for a lot of reasons, but one of which is that people will actually watch Howard yeah. University this year. MEAC is trembling, obviously, at, the, at this point. Yeah, I was funny you mentioned that because I was going to ask you before we sign off, what's new on the transfer front? So we, we got our answer. That, yeah, that's kind of new. Uh, the other part that I'm actually working on right now is, is kind of going through and seeing most of the transfer waivers so far have been these runoff variety of waivers, which is basically means that the previous staff signed off um, on the fact that they didn't offer a scholarship to the player. So uh, he's automatically eligible. The NCAA just rubber stamps it and says, all right, well, they didn't offer you a scholarship. You were run off, so you're eligible to play right away. You okay. don't have to sit out. Yeah, yeah. I want to find out how many COVID waivers oh. are going to be approved this year. So I'm, I'm going to work on that here in the yeah. next week or so. So I'll, I'll report back yes. uh, to you next week, hopefully, with some numbers on how many COVID waivers because – it's going to be interesting to see if the NCAA fights any of these COVID waivers oh. or they just say, you know what, we're going to let everybody transfer play this year. It, you know, it is what it is. Otherwise we're going to get lawsuits left and right. I, I think we that's the prudent way to go. Not that they've always adopted the prudent way, but that makes sense. I hope the lawyers are telling them, Hey, please, this, it, it's all aberrational this year. We all trust this. We all try. Got, we hope this is everything about this. Yeah, let's just make it work. You know, I, I also reported that the Big East and the Big Ten, according to my sources, have both talked about a bubble, trying to do a bubble within the league. Really? I don't think it's going to fly because I think the cost is going to be too much, Bob. Um, but I, I do feel like it's the best way to be able to pull it off because the part that we haven't talked about, what about the referees? Yeah. Like, how do they go – some of these referees in college – will be in nine spots in nine consecutive days. How do you test them every day? How are they, you know, whether they're flying, driving, staying in hotels, how are you keeping on top of it where a bubble is a far more effective way if you kept the refs in one spot for two weeks and played, let's say you had every team in the Big East, right, in, I don't know where you, where you do it. You could do it uh, 
you pick a spot, whoever you can, you can pick Providence, Rhode Island, if, if you wanted it. Right. And, and you, and you have the games there and they played, you know, for three weeks, they go to the bubble and let's say over three weeks, they played every team once they played nine games over 21 days They quarantine, they test. Um, why not? You play those nine, you go through it once. And then you maybe go home for two weeks and then you come back and you do it again for three more weeks. And that's your, that's your schedule for the year. And at least you, you've played that many games under a bubble. Now the problem is Bob, what are the other leagues going to do? Conference USA can't do it. Uh, oh, that, well, this is where the, the, the conference realignment geography, the abrogation of all geography and common sense and con, you know, conferences is, and, and it's, It'd well, be money. It'd be money, Bob. That those leagues can't do a bubble like the like I was talking to one coach and at a lower level, and he said, "Listen, it'd be great to do a bubble, but we we can't afford testing. I mean, right now, I was told by one program, they said we're getting rid of our drug testing to do COVID testing. Oh, no more drug testing, so so kids can smoke weed all they want now, and they know that at that school, <laughs> and and I think it's going to be." Not not just a one-off. I think you're going to have a lot of schools have to give in order to do COVID testing. They're going to have to give in, in a lot of other areas. Oh boy. Well, plenty to think about. Wow. Yeah. No, it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot to try to figure out. Luckily, we have NBA. We have NHL. I've become a, a Carolina Hurricanes fan now okay. because of my daughter. And they're fun. They're fun to watch. If you want to watch a good team in, in, okay. in hockey, watch the first line. I can't pronounce their names. Um, Okay. That's in the cop I can pronounce. I'll get it. Um, they're young. They're fun to watch. So I'm, I'm starting to watch a little bit of hockey. Uh, obviously, NBA, uh, baseball, I'm not even bothering with anymore. I, I just have no confidence that there's actually going to be a postseason in baseball anyway. It's scary, but I'm, I'm, I'm slogging through it. Are you? you you're still trying to – are, are you really watching the Reds? I mean, the Red Sox oh, are painful to watch. Oh, oh, I'm in, I'm, there's other stuff to watch, too, you know. But I might I, I turn in and see what's going on. Got shocked last night. Martin Perez throws five shutout innings, and and the relievers hold him hitless. So you never know. You know that was a you never, you never know thing. And again, you know, the way the Dodger and the Padres game ended with this incredible throw from left field to, on a fly oh. ball double play to end the game. What a always a dramatic way to end the game, but this throw was a you know otherworldly. So anyway, I still love that game. I'm a, I hate to tell you, so I'm still all right. All right, you can love it. I just man, I. I have a hard time investing in it yeah. without the without the <clears throat> confidence that it's going to be able to. to no, they can't. No, it to right. Well, it, it, there is no guarantee. No, it, it's very tenuous. Yep. But fortunately, basketball <laughs> so far the bubble's working so far. You got an update there, Bob? What's yeah. your update? <laughs> I don't know. What's the score? Is there a score update? <laughs> there, there's no game yet, is there? Uh, no. You know, I have this is the app. You know, the app does this. Oh, no, it, it keeps you updated. That's my wife crazy because it goes off in the middle of the night when I'm using this as, a, as an alarm. You this keep my alarm. Phone. Huh? This, this is how I use – dude, this is what I use for an alarm. So you, know? you keep your phone on all night and that thing uh, – When I do, sleep. when I want an alarm. Right. Yeah, well, it's plugged in, you know. Yeah. And I, that's how I use – that's what I use. And, but the, the, the downside is that app goes off at 3 in the morning and she's not pleased. Oh, I don't blame her. I'd be <laughs> – and listen, I would be upset too. I, I've started turning off my phone. Um, Actually, uh, this is a golf alert. Uh, Tiger misses from inside 10 feet for a birdie at the 12th, then rolls one in from 33 feet on the 13th. All right, PJ. There you have it. There's your okay. update. There's your update. All right, well, listen, Michael Porter Jr. must see TV. TJ Warren. That. That's, the, that's the number one thing. That's number one. I want to see it. I want to see it. Well, keep, keep. Maybe we'll try to get Michael Porter Jr. on this podcast at some point. Okay. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll go easy on him. All right. Listen. <laughs> uh, good catching right. up. And uh, what, what is today? Is today Today's Thursday? Thursday. Talk to you. The weekend is almost upon us. So have a good weekend. And uh, we'll talk soon.